Hey everybody, welcome to the Single Tracks Podcast. My name is Jeff, and today my guest is Susie Murphy. Susie is the executive director of the San Diego Mountain Bike Association and also a board member with the California Mountain Biking Coalition. Thanks for joining us, Susie. You bet. Thanks for having me. Well, tell us a bit about the San Diego Mountain Bike Association. What's the organization's mission and how large is your membership? Well, uh, the San Diego Mountain Biking Association, which we either call SDMBA or STIMBA for short. STIMBA. Okay, that's good. That'll be helpful. <laughs> One of those acronyms, so I'll probably just call it STIMBA, if that's okay. Um, yes. has been around since 1994, uh, one of the older trail orgs in the country. Oh, wow. Yeah. Founded by friends who are frustrated with trail access, even then, mm -hmm. <laughs> then and now. <laughs> and yes. we, uh, our mission is to improve trail access for mountain biking in San Diego County. San Diego County is very a very large county. I was just talking with some people last night and they they were new, new to the area and they're like, man, this county is big. <laughs> yeah. Very big. And we can get into it a little later with some of the other questions about uh, the dynamics that involve San Diego County. But yeah, it's a big county. Yeah. Millions of people living there. Mm, yeah. Three and a half million. It would be four wow. million before too long, really. Wow. Uh, so yes. And right now we're standing at about 1,700 members, give or take. Okay. Uh, growing all the time, grown over the, the pandemic, so just on a slow curve up, which is great. Mm -hmm. Lots of new riders yeah. that we're trying to attract. And we're a 501c3 incorporated in 2005. We have right now four staff members, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I was the first ever paid staff person oh, wow. hired in 2006, 2016. So, you know, when any organization okay. can work up to have paid staff to answer the phones and keep the lights on and all that stuff, it really just multiplies your efforts in a dramatic way. Yeah. And so then we have a full-time trails coordinator, Ben Stone who is an amazing advocate, but also a machine operator and a trails guy and a GIS map specialist and mm. all those things. And we have a, a seasonal full-time trail uh, specialist right now helping Ben, and we have uh, a communications and marketing person full-time as well. Wow. Wow. That's great. And our yeah volunteer board has 11 people and all our volunteers and members. Well, that's interesting that the group has been around for so long and if my math is right, you guys were around for 20 years before hiring a full-time staff. And, and now you've grown even just in the last six years from you to, to having this team. Like what, how are you able to do that and, and find the funding and the resources to make that happen? Well, it's sort of like there's a tipping point, right? There's so many groups around the country and in California that are all volunteer driven. And Stimba was like that for 20 some years. And at a certain point, the board makes a decision to try to ramp up the revenue enough to be able to uh, to get a job description together and hire somebody. Yeah. So that's happening more, more and more. I see job postings for executive directors around the country yeah. for trail organizations or stewardship nonprofits. Mm -hmm. And that's terrific. So there is momentum behind this. Mm -hmm. And once an organization, even a small nonprofit can gear up to hire somebody, it's just like a snowball. Right. There's hmm. there's somebody there doing it every day. There's somebody working with donors, talking to sponsors, advocating with land managers and, and the work. The mission is is progressing, mm -hmm. but also the just the capacity. Right. right. You're making your website better. You're making it easier to take donations. You're doing events that bring in money. And so if you have somebody full time, uh, it just snowballs. And then I, I think if, if you're managed, if the board is, has the vision and things are managed like a business, um, it just grows and that we've been an example of that, but we're following, you know, amazing role models like, uh, you know, Sierra Boots trail stewardship or mm -hmm. Santa Cruz mountains trail stewardship or Tamba in Tahoe. Like they're all doing amazing work and we all are working together to raise all of us up. So even the smaller organizations. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, we recently talked to um, Travis from NIMBA and he said the same thing that, you know, they've in recent years been able to hire more and more staff. And, and that's that's really awesome. So how is your group organized? Sixteen hundred members. Is it just kind of one big chapter uh, or do you have like sort of subgroups uh, in various parts of the county? 
We, we cover the whole county. We don't have formal subgroups. We have like interest groups, I guess. So like North County, mm -hmm. South County, like we have different lists that uh, people can join uh, when they become a member or, or later to say, oh, if you do an email special about something going on in North County, we have like an email list for different groups. And then we have committees mm -hmm. and things like event committee and, uh, you know, finance executive committee, of course, and trails committee, advocacy committee, and they work at various levels of capacity, depending on what's going on. But we're pretty, pretty centralized. And then um, what we try to do is, since we are a big county, and there are regional interests uh, that differ across the county, we try to cultivate lead volunteers, we call them trail liaisons mm -hmm. for different areas. So they might have an interest in a particular park or a particular open space, or maybe they have a particular interest in our local national forest or our local state park. And so we try to cultivate those people to help them develop a really strong relationship with whoever the land manager is and have them sort of be our point of contact, right? If they ride there weekly or, or more than once a week, and they can pop into the ranger office and be like, hey, what's going on? I saw that this is happening. Can we help? And so that's what really uh, helps decentralize and focus um, our attention on places that, we, you know, I can't be there every day. Then our trails coordinator can't be there every day. Um, it's, it's sometimes difficult to find the right person with the right sensibility and the time mm -hmm. to devote to that. But when we find good ones, they, they stick and they're, they're awesome. So we're always on the lookout for people to help in a, that higher capacity as a lead volunteer. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that sounds like a great model. So at this point, how much bike legal single track would you say the San Diego Mountain Bike Association supports? Mm, that's a tough question for our area. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that I'd have many people. We, Southern California in general has a lot of, we have a lot of single track, but we also have a lot of old ranch roads, old double track, oh, old truck right. trails. So it's, mm -hmm. which all of which is super popular with not only mountain bikers uh, at times, depending cross country, right. Or, um, but also the gravel crowd and the bike packing crowd. We have a huge, huge thing going on with that here locally. But as far as mileage, of single track, I, I would have, I was trying to think of a number. I wanted to say a hundred miles, but it might be more than that. It's just really hard because we're so multi-jurisdictional. Mm -hmm. We're not a trail org that's like, we work with this one state park and we know exactly <laughs> how many miles right. we, we, you know, we work with federal, state and local. Yeah. Uh, over 20, 20 different jurisdictions and agencies. So that's a, it's a tricky question. I should try to figure it out someday, but right. I'm not going <laughs> to do it right now. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's interesting too. You, you mentioned, you know, having like single track, but also a lot of other different surfaces. And, you know, I've ridden a little bit in Southern California and it's like, you know, a lot of it is, you know, it's like wide ish trail paths. And it's like, well, is that single track or is it a fire road or what is it? And so, yeah, it's, it's definitely a hazy, hazy definition there. Yeah, it is. It is. We're just happy when things connect and things are fun. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned that uh, Stemba got its start in 94. Was there like a particular issue or situation that was happening that like caused some mountain bikers to get together and, and get organized? You know, I don't know if there was one particular issue. I would say back in those days, most of the riding was either in our, you know, canyons that go up and down the county that are pretty accessible to neighborhoods. Um and also out in the for uh, Cleveland National Forest and state parks. And I think some of the guys who originally founded Stimba, um, there might have been some state park issues going on particularly, but I think they just, in, even in those early days, were so enamored with the sport. And, you know, trail advocates are, I just think you're born into it. It's hard, like you just have to have the right sensibility. And I think the right group of three or four guys got together and said, we should start an organization. And Corba was already going, the Concerned Off-Road Mountain Bike Association was going on with Steve Messer up in LA. So I think there could have been some inspiration from uh, our neighbors to the North. So I don't, I don't think it was one particular thing. I just think they felt that uh, with the sport growing as it was in the mid nineties, that they needed to start an organization. And so it was really informal at first, uh, like the 501c3 status didn't come until a few years after they were already doing things. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and they had a couple of fun rides, get people together and, and go out and do trail work. And it was much more informal in those days. I don't think it was, you know, <laughs> can reminisce about how uncomplicated it was. It was still complicated, but I'm, I'm grateful that they started um, doing it so early, you know, to lay the groundwork. Yeah, that's great. Well, you mentioned being born into trail advocacy and, you know, you, you've been at Stemba for about six years. What were you doing before that? <laughs> Um, well, I say I only have a 10 year attention span, so, <laughs> but I was teaching elementary school for 10 years. Okay. Yeah. And then before that took a couple years off when my kids were really little. And then before that, I, I was working in some gallery and museum sort of environments. Cause I'm an art, art history major that gives me mm -hmm. any trail cred. I don't yeah. know. But <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I've had several, I have had a lot of different experience. I've had retail experience. I've had uh, event experience before I had education experience. I also am a lifetime member of Girl Scouts. So I have that oh, wow. whole yeah. scouting, yes. really strong scouting background. Yeah. So that is, I think that experience and doing a lot of camping with my family and Girl Scouts and whatever laid a foundation of stewardship and mm -hmm. appreciation for nature and all of that stuff. So I think that's where the, that's where all that comes from. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, let's talk about this recent boom in mountain bike participation. How has that sort of changed things for Stemba? Have you seen a lot of membership growth? And then on the flip side, are you seeing more trail user conflicts that, that need to be dealt with? When I do a spot check of Strava heat maps mm -hmm. for certain trails in the area, I am astounded at the percentage of growth wow. uh, in the last, you know, since COVID started. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some of it is 300, 400% increase in traffic. And that's not just in San Diego, that's everywhere. I mean, Look at Sedona this weekend. I don't, know, I don't know. People are at the bike festival in the rain, but I mean, the, even those, if you spot check those trails in Sedona, I mean, it's just insane. Yeah. So that is uh, an opportunity, but it's also a, an issue. Mm -hmm. And so we, like I said, our, our membership has been on a slow, steady pace of growth. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's surprisingly slow and frustrating because, you know, there's an estimated probably 50,000 mountain bikers in San Diego County, probably more than that at this point. Yeah, easily. Uh, and why do I only, why do I only have 1700 members? Right. You know, how, what am I doing? That's not telling them what we do. So, you know, it's the constant, just communications uh, and outreach thing. Yeah. So there are opportunities there. We had an in-person event last night uh, about a project and we had 60 people show up and we had almost a dozen people sign up. Huh. Whenever we go out and we talk to people, they're like, oh, well, yeah, I'll take my membership, you know? <laughs> so it's just a matter of time and energy and effort to engage people. Right, right. So, but the, con the issues and the constraints of all the people on the trails and not just mountain bikers, more hikers, more dog walkers, more trail runners, families out mm -hmm. and still equestrians, although that that's not a growing base in my opinion, right. has impacted our most popular trails to the point where, uh, you know, I hate the term love to death is overused, but they are. Our land managers are struggling with staffing, you know, since this pandemic, yeah. they're struggling with trying to ramp up their staff again now that they have all this, you know, there is some extra funding for different agencies, but they're having trouble finding the right people or retaining the right people. So that just leads to more. If we're working on a project and then uh, say with whoever, name an agency, and we're working with a person and then that person moves to a different job and then we have to start back. Okay, well, we were talking to them about this and we were, mm -hmm. you know, it just slows everything down. It slowed everything down. Yeah. But just from a practical, you know, the trail user conflict situation, we have worked locally and using resources to try to constantly get the message about everybody trying to get along on the trails. We've been able to reboot our trail bell program. So we've uh, opened up six or seven new bell stations uh, that volunteers stock the bells, you know, and just encourage bike riders to use bells mostly as a, uh, just a, a visual to be like, please just, you know, be nice and say, hi, we've done some internal content creation of videos and stuff with some sponsor and grant help 
Um, we did a fun series of videos aimed at mountain bikers, really, like not talking to other trail users, just this is for you mountain bikers. And we tried to make it kind of funny and light. You can find it on our YouTube channel, um, but they're kind of funny. People seem to like them. <laughs> and we had fun making them and trying to get the point across, but keep it light as well. We all, as trail orgs, try to share resources like that when we can. I mean, graphics that Santa Cruz uh, Mountain Trail Stewardship came out, they're like comic series about trail etiquette. That, um, done by Sketchy Trails, uh, the artist, Mm -hmm. is those things are just amazing. We use them all the time. And then we've been involved during COVID. We became a member of the Recreate Responsibly Coalition, Mm -hmm. um, which is a nationwide movement now and has a California chapter. And so I was pretty involved in all of those calls. And they had a series of like a toolkit Mm -hmm. of things about, you know, basic stuff, leave no trace, be prepared, just basic outdoor preparedness. Mm -hmm. And then uh, like trails are common ground, which is a kind of a newer resource um, with uh, Dave Weens of Inba is pretty involved in that uh, situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so just trying to use whatever we can to get the word out to people. And plus just talking to people locally, like we'll pop up our, uh, do a pop-up event and set up our booth or canopy, you know, out at a trailhead and talk to people and hand out bells. Mm -hmm. And that's always really good when we can do that because uh, it works on many levels. But there's still, you know, there are conflicts, but I think in public meetings or public comments on certain projects, I think we as advocates see a lot of um, anecdotal stories from trail users who may not be mountain bike friendly. Mm -hmm. And in our, in my opinion, and I'm not speaking for anybody else, I think a lot of those are perceived like somebody could have a story that's 10 years old about something that happened to them on a trail and they still pull it yeah. up in a meeting now. And it's like, well, when, yeah. when I'm out there, I'm not seeing any of that kind of behavior and not to say that things don't happen, but I think the perception sometimes of a vocal few in a public meeting can really skew the decision-making process. And it's just, we did, we're trying to stand up to that and make sure that people's stories are based in reality. Yeah. Well, are some of the government agencies that you work with, I mean, is this like increase in participation, helping them see like how much people value recreation and and saying, hey, maybe we need more trails. I mean, the ones we have are so busy and clearly people want it. So do do you see that as an opportunity? Absolutely. This has been, um, I mean, for the past two years, once we all realized what was happening with um, everybody getting outside, and how much when the crisis of the pandemic happened, everybody headed outside. It was the only thing, the only thing people had. Mm-hmm. And so the point is now that we need better trails, like maintain the stuff we have, mm-hmm. uh, fix it so it's more sustainable. If it's old alignments, needs reroutes, uh, whatever. We have a lot of that here. But um, but also new trails where they're appropriate and we can work them through the system, right? There is an obvious need. A lot of the I'll, I'll go ahead and a lot of the unsanctioned stuff that is happening all over is because the land managers and the agencies are not providing for the need of the people that live in the area. Right. And so yes, we I use this as a constant drumbeat with all the funding that has come down the outdoors for all federal funding and state funding, like some of that is now trickling down and we need to make sure we're trying to all make sure that it gets into trail projects for sure. Yeah. That's, that's, that's great. Well, uh, are there a lot of opportunities for building new trails around San Diego? I mean, it seems like it's, it's a pretty densely populated area. And I mean, I would think most of the land is already spoken for. So is, is there opportunity there or, or is it more about just, holding on to access or maybe gaining access to some trails that the bikes aren't currently allowed on? So you are correct about San Diego. It is a very complicated, expensive place. And (laughs) we measure new trail in feet. (laughs) When, you know, I hear of a story, oh, well, in Nevada, we're building a 60 mile trail system. I'm like, that's awesome. That will, (laughs) I hate to be, that will never happen here in San Diego. (laughs) Uh, really. So, um, you know, we, we have opportunities, but they are not massive trail systems. We don't have a ski mountain, right? You know, we never will. So, uh, we have to be creative in working with our land managers to help them see that a trail, maybe a brand new trail, 
uh, would help the connectivity or the loop opportunities of an area and like disperse people off to maybe help the impact. Um, so that's one opportunity. There are opportunities sometimes that we have with, um, I hate to say it, but with developers, if a area gets developed, we can um, try to impress upon the developer that having trails as part of their community yeah. would be an amenity that their residents would like. So some people don't like that we talk to developers, but you know, if house we, we prefer that houses don't happen, but if they happen, we want them to have trails and not just sidewalk trails, like real, like single track trails. Right. And so that's yeah, dirt trails. Uh, we'll see what that's complicated, but that's an opportunity. We do have opportunities out where there's less population. So our Cleveland National Forest has some opportunities that we've explored for years, for mm-hmm. a decade, even before my time as staff. Mm. Uh, so we do have a plan with the Descanso District. That's Mount Laguna, Noble Canyon. Uh, Noble Canyon is probably our most famous trail. Uh, people shuttle it. Uh, it's pretty chunky and fun. And mm. that Mount Laguna recreation area, we've been working on a Mount Laguna trails restoration plan with the Forest Service uh, for mm-hmm. five years now and are almost through, almost through where it will be signed off on and we can start implementing and that that project, um, just in this example, it allows for some new brand new trail alignments, uh, which are going to be fun and um, super great connectors to con- uh, to connect some different places and also uh, some reroutes on some really terrible stuff. And the most exciting part is bringing some unsanctioned trails into the system. Oh, that's always great. So, yeah. So that's that's an example of. A long-term project, um, great partners with the, with the Cleveland National Forest, uh, and we believe there's other opportunities, um, like on the Palomar District, which is the other district of the forest here, and we're going to keep pushing for those opportunities as well. The county has some opportunity for new trails, but uh, the county, uh, our county of San Diego Parks and Recreation Department is awesome, and they're very trail friendly, mm-hmm. and they're they understand the need. I also sit on the Parks Advisory Committee in another hat that I wear for the county. It's an appointed position, but it's good to have a mountain biker at the table because I'm the only mountain biker at that table and it's important. And so, yeah, long story, kind of forgotten what the question was, but <laughs> there's so much to talk about, but yeah, new trail. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not right. It sounds like there's lots of opportunities for new trails. And, uh, and you mentioned one of the more popular riding areas, uh, which is Noble, Noble Canyon. Noble Canyon is part of Mount Laguna. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are there, what are some of the other more popular places for mountain bikers in San Diego County? Well, our number one, like most trafficked place is uh, Penisquitos Canyon Preserve, hmm. uh, which is kind of like smack in the middle of the county. It's an east to west canyon that's very large. Uh, it's managed by the county and the city of San Diego mostly. Mm-hmm. And it has a large network of trails uh, that go from the river valley and then up onto one of the mesas and down into the next canyon over. Mm. Uh, There's an area there called Tunnels, which is very popular with people. It's a very unusual um, kind of riding under the trees, through the trees. It's really fun. That area is highly contested, surrounded by development. Uh, Lots of trails in that area that we used to ride in the the late 80s have all been gobbled up by houses. And so that's a yeah. constant drumbeat here with our followers and members is that like, well, you should just ride it now because it's all going to get gobbled up by houses. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah. no, I mean, some of it is private land and will be developed, but the stuff that's preserved land uh, is protected in perpetuity. Like the boundary of the preserve is the preserve and it's not going to change. So how do we work then with the... Right the agencies to make sure that the trails um, can stay open. And that, that area has been highly contested. There are, it's just so traveled. Like there's just so many people and so many interests and friends groups and community groups and all of that. So it's, um, but we're actually working on some new things there. Like as we speak, actually I'll be out there tomorrow, I think, because it's raining here right now. So tomorrow's the day. We're going to be out working on some some stuff with the rangers that I think people will be excited about. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, so uh, part of this question, too, I was going to give you a real brief bulleted list about why San Diego is complicated. uh, Because people (laughs) are like, why can't we have more trails? Well, 
it's very expensive here, right? I think we just passed the, we're the number one most expensive place to live in the country, I think was a couple of weeks ago, there was an article. I mean, housing prices. So there's that. We have the most federally listed endangered species of any county in the country. Oh my goodness. We have the most Indian reservations of any county in the country. Hmm. Different, like the most different ones. We have an issue of lots of private land that doesn't allow for connectivity, I guess is the best way to say it, especially in the East County. Well, even even in some of the urban canyons, like you have these private parcels and then there's no way through. Hmm. There's a pinch point like from here to right. there. So like how yeah. do you, you know, and our county is has a person who works on those trans-county trail connections. Thank goodness. I mean, it was very helpful, but it's just a long, it's a long easements and all that pouring legal stuff. Yeah. So yeah, it's a complicated place. And plus we have forest service, state parks, BLM, you know, state all the way down to the state stuff, state parks, or U.S. Fish and Wildlife, state parks, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and then the county, and then all the local jurisdictions. Right. Wow. Plus all the land trusts and conservation groups that own land. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's, that is complicated. It is complicated. So that's, you know, People don't like to hear all those reasons why things are complicated, but that's just a fact. It's just a fact. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when people hear San Diego, I mean, obviously we all think about the city and the coast, but within San Diego County, you mentioned forest service land. I mean, some of that is wilderness, right? Is that, is that correct? Yes. Um, I, yeah, that's kind of the next thing. Um, we affectionately call, there's a collection of wilderness that sort of, runs down the backbone of the county, kind of up in the mountains towards East County that runs from north to the south. It's not contiguous. Some of it is BLM uh, wilderness, some is state wilderness, and we call it the wall of wilderness <laughs> because it does halt some connection for bikes. Horses and people are allowed on some of it, mm -hmm. um, but bikes aren't allowed. And so it, it, it definitely hampers connect to the logical connections from the de from the mountains down to the desert or vice versa. Yeah. Especially for bike, for bike packing routes and gravel routes it uh, and, and cross country as well. And maybe even downhill, like it, it impacts the connectivity right. and the opportunity. And so we don't think that bikes should be allowed in all of those areas, but there are certain alignments that we think are traveled now by those other user groups. And we think that probably bikes should be considered. Yeah. But it's not, it's not a super priority. There may, there may come a situation here soon where, where we may need to talk about it more, but it's definitely not, I mean, it's on our list and we, we <laughs> always bring it up, Yeah, but it's not like, we're not actively like, oh, let us in, you know? Right. Sounds like it's, it's on a list of many different roadblocks that, yeah. you know, you have to <laughs> deal with on a, on a daily basis. And, you know, yeah, for I mean, sure. yeah, just considering the cost of land, you know, if, if mountain bikers, you know, have some trails and it's going to be developed and it's like, well, we, we can't afford to buy the land. We can't afford to say, <laughs> we're just going to keep this as trails. And so, yeah, there's just all kinds of constraints. It sounds like, and, and wilderness is just, just one of them. Yeah, just one of them. And, you know, I, I will maybe a little bit of breaking news here, but I probably would be remiss if I didn't mention it since we had a public event last night. We have um, have been advising on a project that's a, tra a new trail project that's happening on a local Indian reservation here in North County, far North County. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's been talked about with various tribes for 20 years. Oh, wow. And it's it's finally happening. So wow. we're working with uh, the contractor is Global Action Sports Solutions, Jeremy Whitech. Hmm. And he just put out a press release the other day about the project and still a lot of there's no opening date yet, but the ground has broken, visited. It's going to be awesome. Uh, so that is an opportunity that we've really wanted one of the reservations to really embrace. And we're super excited about that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's great news. So I want to get your take on uh, another bit of recent news coming out of California about uh, a protest ride that was held over a lack of trail access for mountain bikes. And in that case, uh, ultimately, it sounds like the local council agreed to revisit their decision on bike access following the protest. And, and 
again, protesting, that's not something we normally see out of mountain bikers. So did this surprise you that it, that it built up to that? And, and also curious to know if you're surprised that it seems like it kind of worked. Uh, so this is the Folsom Lake. This was in Pleasanton, California. And oh, Pleasanton. Yeah. Yeah. And there were like police out there and, and everything like blocking the, the riders. And maybe this is a different one than I'm thinking. Cause there was a recent one up at Folsom Lake State Recreation Area where some jumps got demolished. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that might be a different one. Not sure. But that protest ride and their tagline was build, don't bulldoze, mm. which was awesome. <laughs> so Fat Track, uh, Fat Track is the uh, trail organization up there. They did an amazing job of tiptoeing through uh, the communications of doing a protest mm-hmm. and having uh, what we think is has really woken up state parks mm, yeah. to uh, that they're not providing for the need of the people who visit there. Mm-hmm. And it's a state recreation area, which should right. offer more opportunities. Um, so I don't know if that's the one you're talking about, but I, I have known mountain bikers to rally to protest. Mm-hmm. There was a big protest ride here in San Diego in um, 2014 ish, maybe. Mm-hmm. And there was, uh, we have a big regional park called mission trails. Uh, regional park, which is kind of uh, East County, Central East County, not too far out though, populated area, very popular park. It's a very, very large regional park that has trails. A section was closed down because of environmental concerns and Mm -hmm. really popular trail area. And some of the local mountain bikers, they did a protest. They had, I don't know, a few hundred people come out, they, news coverage, the whole thing. So it is not unheard of to me for mountain bikers <laughs> to do a protest ride. Yeah. If people get really riled up, it can be effective if, if mm-hmm. it can be effective if used not too much, right? If used in very, right. in a good way and you have the, the advocates, like the trail organization is actually like staying in communication with whoever the land manager is and being like, look, we're just, we want our members to be able to communicate their frustration but on the other hand, we want to know how, how can we help as the organization? How can we help you right. channel this energy? What can we provide? So you're kind of working at it from the, the protesters getting their frustrations out, but also trying to help the land manager at the same time. Yeah, right. It can't be all just like anger and, and like energy that's all over <laughs> the place. Yeah. You want yeah. to have like kind of that back channel as well. That's like, mm-hmm. you know here's what's going on. This is why these people are frustrated and and we really want to work together to find a solution to it. Yeah. That's awesome. For sure. Well, I'm curious to know what the current discussion looks like around e-bike trail access uh, for Stimba and in the San Diego County area. Is that a controversial thing or is that something that you guys are even actively trying to advocate for? We advocate for mountain bikes Mm -hmm. (laughs) and according to the vehicular code of california class one and two e-bikes are bicycles so Mm. that makes it easy logic would say (laughs) that yes we advocate for mountain bikes so we don't make policy obviously we're just uh, we can have a position so our position that we developed it's on our website we developed it like three years ago now, three and a half years ago, after much debate with our board, is that we think that class one e-bikes are okay on most natural surface trails, Mm -hmm. uh, except in circumstances where the land manager might deem that it's not uh, safe or appropriate. But really, like in working theory, for us in San Diego, I mean, there might be a couple of places where it's kind of tight and fast speeds might not be appropriate. Mm -hmm. But I would say when e-bikes first really started to come around, uh, maybe like four years ago, you know, I'm an old cross country racer. I raced a little downhill, did a little dual slalom, a little super D when that was a thing. You know, I've done all kinds of things. And I, I just thought I was a purist. I thought, oh no, those things (laughs) will never take off. Like a lot of my friends and my husband and, you know, a lot of our friends who have ridden for years were like, Oh no, they, that's terrible. How, you know, that's never going to, people won't like it. It's not going to. Yeah. And I, you know, admittedly, I have totally changed my tune and I'm not the only one. Right. I have totally come to a realization that 
they're here to stay and we need to figure out how to help the land managers understand what they are Mm -hmm. and the opportunities that they can bring, but also how to, you know, provide education and information for e-bike users to get along with everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so that's just my personal evolution and our position as an organization is the same. We believe that class one are okay on most trails that are open to bikes. And I am grateful that in San Diego, we've had a much more progressive um, stance here from uh, our county and the city of San Diego, particularly uh, towards them more than I know that, you know, Orange County and L.A., took a much, the counties up there took a much harder stance for some reason. And I I don't really know the reasoning, but all I know is that our county council and city attorney, city of San Diego attorney, looked at the vehicular code first and foremost. And when it said class one and two bikes are bicycles and not motorized vehicles, they said, the city said first, they're allowed on all trails in city of San Diego that are open to bikes. That's a huge portion of what people ride. Mm. Penisquitos Canyon that I mentioned, mm-hmm. all city of San Diego, miles and miles of trails. Oh. All Most of all of our urban canyons, uh, Mission Trails Park that I mentioned is city of San Diego. So just that's a massive decision. Yeah. And then the county followed not too long after, and they came up with a list of about half of their trails that were open to e-bikes. Mm-hmm. Class one and two based on the vehicular code. And they still need to, I'm after them because that list came out almost three years ago. And there's lists, there's trails that are managed by the county that are still technically not open to mountain, to e-bikes. But I, mm-hmm. I keep asking them to review the list. I said, can we just go through yeah. the list? And, and then I think you need to bring some of these on. And when mm-hmm. I ask, when I ask people at the city or the county, I said, you know, we're two years in, we're three years in. What are you hearing? Like, what are you hearing from your your staff? What are you hearing from from users? Are you hearing anything terrible or anything good? And they're like, we really have no issues uh, to speak that's, of. Yeah, that's good to know. You know, yeah. nobody's nobody's out there getting you know impaled by e bikes. Nobody's like <laughs> electrocuted. Yeah. No, for the most part, like for the city and the county, from what I what they tell me is everything is pretty copacetic. Yeah. So that's great. We're fortunate in that. And then we have a large riding area known as the San Diego River Park, uh, which is Lake Hodges, for those that know. And it's a long, it has probably, I don't know, 60 some miles of trail from east to west. Uh, it covers a huge area, San Pasqual Valley, down through Lake Hodges, uh, Del Dios Gorge, west. It's a super popular route for gravel riders, uh, for mountain bikers, trail runners. They do events there. Um, it's just an awesome connectivity. It's uh, the alignment of the Costa Crest Trail, which is the trail that goes from the mountains all the way down to Del Mar. Okay. Not fully complete, not fully complete yet, but it's a vision and they're working on it. That's all open to e-bikes because most of that is city of San Diego and the county. So because of the decisions, even though that's run by a joint powers management unit, they allowed um, class one and two as well. So that's another huge swath of of e-bike allowance. And then we have Daily Ranch in Escondido, managed by the city of Escondido, that allows class one as well. Mm -hmm. There's a city council meeting, I think next week with the city of San Marcos, that after a long decision-making process, I think it's going to approve class one on their trails. And so all this is starting to come. And so our real, the larger agencies such as State Park, so our local state park district, mm-hmm. which is the Colorado district, is at this time not allowing any e-bikes on trails. You can obviously ride them wherever motor vehicles can drive. Mm-hmm. So like in the in the desert, in Anza Borrego uh, State Park, which is beautiful this time of year, not a lot of single track to speak of there anyway, but it's super fun to go down there and ride bikes on the Jeep trails. Like it's go look at the flowers and, you know, it's beautiful. So e-bikes are allowed on all of those Jeep trails. It's fun. So state parks, no, at this point. And the Forest Service, our Forest Service, the Cleveland National Forest has not made any decision about e-bikes on trails yet, although it's been a discussion. But I mean, this is a this is a topic for a podcast like Allens by itself, as you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, to summarize, it seems like e-bike trail access in San Diego County is 
decent to good to maybe on the cusp of greatness? I would say, I mean, people are obviously riding their bikes on state park land or on forest service land, uh, even though they're technically not supposed to be there. But um, I always tell people like, here's, here's the facts that I know, but I'm not your moral compass. I'm like, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but here's, here's the facts. And, you know, I think at some point, I think uh, for the forest in a nutshell, the forest service is watching some of the pilot programs uh, that are going on, like up in Tahoe national forest with e-bikes. That was a pretty substantial program that's going on. And so once the findings come out from that, I think that some of the other forests are going to have to start to make decisions because there's just a critical, there's a critical mass going on, Mm. uh, I believe. And uh, I will note that the Angeles district uh, of the California state parks up in Los Angeles just last week came out with an order allowing e-bikes on their trails, wherever bikes are allowed. It's a very simple order. Yeah shockingly. And it even uh, came as kind of a surprise to even some of the advocates up there. Like all of a sudden the forest just said, you know, we're just going to allow them. And so I think that things are starting to sway in favor of e-bikes. And I know that some people still are purists and that's fine. Everybody can ride what they want. (laughs) Right. As long as they're, they're nice, nice on the trails and they say hi and they slow down. (laughs) Yes. Well, I mean, I think that's for a lot of those traditional mountain bikers, that was the fear was that, you know, if we start pushing for this e-bike access, that's going to hurt overall access and like the existing trails that we have uh, with our bikes. But it sounds like that's that's not the case in California and that, you know, most land managers can recognize that they're very similar and they can share the trails with everybody else. Yeah. And there's um, even some legislation. This is another whole side of what we're doing, especially at a state level. There's a lot of legislation that's been introduced in the last couple of weeks, and some of it has to do with e-bikes and some with trails even. There's a great trail bill that is really exciting. But the, there's, there's a couple of bills, and I don't, have the, I, sh- I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but about e-bike safety and education, like uh, requiring people to, to go through some classes oh, or I don't, you know, I, different yeah. things. But they're the elected officials and um, assembly people and senators, uh, assembly bills right now are really hearing from lobbyists and from advocacy groups uh, about the need for more bike infrastructure, both on the road and trails, uh, as well as bike safety and pedestrian safety. So that's awesome. Yeah, very good. Well, with so much going on uh, with STEMBA and, and your mission there, What's like the biggest constraint that you would say that, that the group faces? Is it funding? Is it volunteer participation? What is it that's, that's kind of keeping you from, from doing even more? Well, since our mission is improving access for mountain biking in San Diego, our biggest constraint are like the things that I kind of mentioned before about how complicated San Diego is and getting through the red tape. Yeah. And when we do propose a project and it gets to the point where uh, we might fund like the studies. So like I call them the ologists, right? The biologists, the hydrologists, the archeologists, all of that. It just, there's so many things in the way of just even planning an alignment for a trail. We have a very vocal, different groups of environmentalists here in town Mm -hmm. who don't, have the same vision that we do for public access. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Just put it that way. So in meetings and public comment periods for certain things, we run across the same old, the same arguments. Mm-hmm. And we believe that most mountain bikers are also stewards, right? We, we, a lot of them want to volunteer. They want to pick up trash. They want to help make the trails better. They want to donate, you know, for whatever, for the trail projects to improve signage, to uh, support the bell, trail bell program, like whatever those things are, they, they want to help. Mm-hmm. And they're appreciative nature. I mean, we're campers and we're all, you know, backpackers or where we want to go out on a trail and walk with our dogs and our kids right. or whatever it is. But we are, most of us are, I believe, stewards and nature lovers and we are environmentalists. Like we want to protect things, but we also want to have a way to go out and appreciate it and be in nature. And there are some people, some uh, environmentalists, whether they're individuals or part of a group that have a different 
philosophy that people should be locked out of certain areas. And I, you know, personally, like I, there, of course there are certain areas if they're that sensitive and they need to just be blocked off to all human access that yes, I agree with that, but I have an issue when an agency tries to create an Island of that kind of space with no public access at all in an air, in a, in a suburban urban area that's surrounded by, I don't know, <laughs> within a five mile radius, it's surrounded by 120,000 people. Right. I just don't think it's realistic. Yeah. I just, I don't think it's realistic. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It makes sense. Well, so in addition to serving as the STEMBA executive director, you're also a board member with the California Mountain Biking Coalition, which is a fairly new group, right? So how do the two groups work together? So the California Mountain Biking Coalition, which we call CAMTB for short, was the brainchild of a few of us, I guess, lead advocates across the state over too many beers a few times to be like, somebody should make a statewide California Trails Association. Well, here we are. So <laughs> we floated this idea for a few years at the a conference that's called the California Trails and Greenways Conference that's mm -hmm. put on every year by California State Parks. But it's not just a state park thing. It's like it's kind of all different kinds of land managers and different stakeholder groups, uh, equestrians and mountain bikers and hikers and PCT people. Like all, it's really fun. You get together with all different kinds of people. Yeah. Um, it's going to be held again in person. They've done a couple of virtual ones. It'll be in person this year in April in Modesto of all places, but yeah, I'm excited to go to Modesto. And at that, we had some side meetings uh, at that conference for a couple of years about how we would do this, what it would look like, what would be the, organizational structure, how would it work? Mm -hmm. And so um, three, we incorporated uh, right before the pandemic started. So in late 2019, we got our determination and we intentionally formed as a 501c4 nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the reason for that, I'll, I'll give a quick primer. And um, most trail orgs are 501c3s. Most nonprofits are 501c3s. They can accept donations that are tax deductible they have their mission. Um, the one limitation that a C3 has is that you can't endorse candidates. You can't lobby. Mm -hmm. You can advocate. You can educate, you know, reach out to elected officials and tell them what you're doing and that, you know, you would like their support, but you can't actively like lobby them. Mm -hmm. Okay. As a C4, you can do some of those activities. Mm -hmm. You can go to Sacramento. You can have a lobbyist. You can endorse candidates to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we felt that we needed. We needed a voice in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we call it like the super pack of mountain biking, which is like what we <laughs> need, like what we need. Yeah. So we intentionally formed as a C4. Uh, we have, a, I'm a founding board member along with some just really inspirational people who have been doing this for a very long time. Steve Messer of Corba up in LA, Vernon Huffman of Access for Bikes in Marin, um, Jake Bayless uh, out of uh, Sonoma. And uh, Matthew Blaine, who's with San Francisco Urban Writers. And we've brought on a couple new board members lately, which is really exciting. Trying to get a varied background of people from also varied geography across the state. Like we don't want everybody from Southern California or everybody from the Bay Area or, you know, so that's uh, trying to find different people. So it's really exciting. The board is really dynamic. It inspires me every day if I get frustrated here locally when we back up and look at it from a higher level of what we're doing with CMTB, it, it really honestly keeps me going. And especially with some of this legislation that's come down. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's super exciting. And the way the structure works is that CMTB is not a, we don't take individual memberships, okay. right? Like a person at this point, we don't take individual memberships. We obviously have a mailing list. Anybody's welcome to go to our website at the, uh, cmtb.org and sign up for our newsletter. Okay. But our members are our trail organizations. And so at this point, we're almost at 30 trail organizations from across the state. Uh, if you go to the website, you can see the map that shows everybody from us all the way down in the South, 
all the way up up north, Bay Area and beyond, uh, Tampa, you know, east of the Sierras and so on. So we're super excited when new members come on. We have very large organizations like, you know, Santa Cruz or we're considered, a Stimba is considered a larger organization as well, mm-hmm. um, to very, very small one, like very small, small volunteer driven groups. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that's the structure uh, with our board. Um, we have an advisory council. So each group that joins gets two people on the advisory council. Okay. And yeah, it's just, it's just amazing already the amount of knowledge sharing. And one of our big priorities was working through the, the quagmire that is state parks. Mm-hmm. And so we have many different working groups, uh, state park working groups that have involved the highest levels of state parks up to the director, regular meetings, phone calls, groups that are working on different aspects of state parks, mm-hmm. like their out, I'll say it, their outdated trails manual, like right. <laughs> crazy stuff. <laughs> so um, anyway, yeah, it was a vision, honestly, that we just knew we had to act on. Mm-hmm. And we just feel if, if we want to play with the big boys, uh, like, you know, all certain groups that have C4s, that have really huge impact on outdoor recreation and uh, open space, public land decisions in, in California, we have to play like the big boys. So that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I was going to ask about how sort of effective you think that's going to be, because as you mentioned, most mountain bike trail ag- advocacy groups are the 5013C, mm-hmm. uh, which you know, EMBA is one. And there were years ago, there were people saying, Hey, how come EMBA doesn't lobby more? And it's like, well, they, they're not allowed to. Yeah. But it sounds like, you know, if we look at groups outside of mountain biking, advocating for different things that, that those that are able to lobby tend to get results. So yeah, it does. It seems like it does seem like an opportunity for sure. It seems to be the model. And we, you know, we want to affect change at, at those high levels, whether it's through legislation or working on um, trying to update the policies of agencies like the state parks or their processes of, you know, trail work, trail approval, partnerships, all that kind of stuff. But it's also to serve our member organizations, right? So if, if a small organization just needs help, like legally with their nonprofit status, right? All of us that have been doing this, we have the knowledge to just help them on right. basic questions. Like, how do you, how do you, what is your website like? How do you, how do you manage, you know, taking donations or setting up events or, mm-hmm. you know, all that nitty gritty, just organizational stuff is, is so great to be able to put out a question and be like, how do you guys do this? Mm-hmm. You know, and it's, it's, I love it. I love being able to help smaller organizations with advice and providing them with, when it comes to trail work or trail projects, you know, if somebody's having success with state parks, say in Santa Cruz, how do we replicate that in another area that may be stuck in a inaction to any sort of projects that benefit trail users or mountain bikes in another area? Hashtag mm-hmm. San Diego. <laughs> how do we uh, replicate those successes? Like explain to state parks, look, mm-hmm. This park and this trail organization are doing this awesome work with new trails and approving stuff and getting stuff through. Mm -hmm. And then in another park, like nothing ever gets done. So how do we build on the successes? Yeah, that's great. So, uh, it's, it's inspiring and it's exciting. And I really, you can look us, look, uh, both SDMBA and CMTB follow, you know, follow the social medias. We've all got the, Facebooks and Instagrams and Twitters. So there's a lot going on um, that we're trying to communicate through those channels. But I would recommend, um, I mean, if you're in San Diego, definitely sign up for our newsletter uh, at stimba.com, but also uh, look up cmtb.org and sign up for the newsletter there. Uh, there's big stuff going on for sure. Yeah. And I think our first, our first big test is this legislation that's just been introduced by assembly member um, Bennett. I don't remember his district, but it's AB 1789 and it's a trails bill that calls for quite a substantial amount of money to establish, actually reestablish a trails commission Mm. for California, plus a staff position that would be called the California trails coordinator. What a cool job is that? Anyway, (laughs) um, but the trails commission would be appointed positions that go through the the, uh, committee for natural resource management 
So appointed positions with, with, uh, eight people where you have like, you know, you have one mountain biker, one equestrian, one, one hiker type person, you know, there's each of the eight positions comes from a different stakeholder group. Mm -hmm. And so that's a huge deal. So we're just working on a plan right now to put out the message about that bill. And then how can we find additional assembly members? And this is a C4. We can do this, right? We can go to our different assembly members and tell them we fully support this. We want you to sign on as a co-sponsor. Uh, and this is why. And so we're probably going to start that as early as this next week, which is really exciting. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Like you said, lots of big news, lots of things going on. And yeah, we'll be sure to share those links uh, that you mentioned as well in the show notes. Susie, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us and, and for all the work you're doing in California. Yeah, you bet. It's, um, it's hard work, but I really enjoy it and am just inspired. And, you know, when I get tired of sitting behind my computer, which is too often, I just need to remember <laughs> to go out on a ride because that's really why we're all here. <laughs> yes, that's great advice. Well, thank you. That's all we've got this week. We'll talk to you again next week. Bye.